Uh, today we have a very interesting session uh, to start us off on one of the one of the tracks. It's action research during a pandemic with Indus Action. And just before I hand it over to the Indus Action and Reap Benefit uh, team, I'd just like to go over a few ground rules. Uh, so we are recording this session for the purpose of documentation and dissemination. So please let us know in the chat box if you are if you would not like to be recorded or quoted in any of the documents or the videos that will form uh, will come out from this. Uh, in the interest of active um, consent uh, seeking, we will be removing any AI note taking assistance in the call. Uh, so yeah, I just want you to be a little bit mindful of that. Uh, to save bandwidth as well, please do turn off your camera and keep yourself on mute unless of course you are speaking or making a comment or asking a question. Uh, you can speak in Hindi or English based on your comfort. We all, many of us from the Quicksand team are, can speak in both and we can always help you out if you need some assistance um, in translation. So don't hesitate to kind of speak in the language of your comfort. Uh, please do use the chat box and leave your comments and and questions in that. And it would be great if you could introduce yourself and your organization along with it. Um, also just a small request to try not to interrupt the speakers or the presentation and try to hold on to your questions till later. We do have about half an hour or 25 minutes to go, go over questions and comments. So if you could hold on to them till then, unless there's obviously something pressing, feel free to write it down in the, in the chat. Um, and please do stick to time, as I mentioned already. The sessions are parallelly programmed, and in case we run over here, then it kind of has a domino effect on the rest of the sessions. Um, so quickly with that, I'd like to move on to the agenda, uh, just to give everyone a sense of how the session is going to be structured. So we're at the five minutes introductions, which is uh, which is being led by me. Uh, sorry, I think I forgot to introduce myself. Um, my name is Nitya. I work with Quicksand. I'm a design researcher. And over the last year, Quicksand has been anchoring the CoreNet con uh, the CoreNet um, community. And after a year, we have come together to culminate into, into a conference. And we're at, we're at day two today. Um, after the, my, these quick introductions and sort of going over the ground rules, I will hand it over to the Indus Action and Reap Benefit teams to walk us through their presentation. Um, and after that, as promised, at about 25 to 30 minutes for questions and an engaging discussion. Uh, just before I jump into handing it over, I just wanted to give a bit of a recap or context setting for those of you who might be new and not uh, very well versed with the CoreNet community. Uh, so CoreNet, or the COVID-19 Research Network, is an effort to build a community of practice to foster exchange and collaboration among research organizations, gathering information relevant to COVID-19 pandemic in India. It is uh, being anchored by Quicksan and is supported uh, by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, over the past year, we have managed to uh, have 60, 60 plus member organizations working across 23 geographies as part of the network. We have more than 200 individual members on our Slack community space and almost on an everyday basis, we're exchanging articles, exchanging events, ex you know, uh, collaborating over research projects. Um, to that effect, we have about almost 80 submitted research projects on our web platform. We've hosted 19 coffee hour sessions and three ethics dialogues. And this is, is the first sort of coming together of all of this as the conference. Uh, and we thought just after a year, it would be a good point to kind of come back and bring the community together as a larger whole to bring in new stakeholders, uh, participants and collaborate uh, to learn from sort of new, new researchers and, and organizations who are engaging in COVID-19 research work. Uh, and with that, I just uh, like to quickly introduce um, the presenters or the speakers today. We have Madhuri and Hitesh from the Indus Action team who will be engaging with uh, Ashish from the REAP Benefit team. Uh, so Madhuri is passionate about working with children in the public education sector and creating research-based policy. At Indus Action, she leads operations in Chhattisgarh and heads the strategy and learning department. She's an, an alumni of the Harvard Graduate School of Education with a master's in education in international education policy. Hitesh is an alumni of Delhi School of Economics. He has conducted research on education curriculum, public policy, uh, research and operations have been, his, have been his focus for the last three years at Indus Action. And Ashish has worked with more than 500 young citizens in the span of two years of, um, in the span of two years on civic and environmental issues. He is a mentor at Reap Benefit and anchors a civic leadership incubator program as well. And with that, I just hand it over to the, to, yeah, to the, to the esteemed panelists for today. Thank you for uh, making it to this panel discussion. So this is meant to be more of a dialogue and a conversation between Hitesh, Ashish and myself. 
where uh, we are going to just delve into action research, what it means, what it means, particularly in the time of pandemic and uh, how and then tying into some examples of action research that we've done in the past year and what their results have been, what is the impact and the intended impact of such action research. Uh, we'll then talk a little about technology and the tools that we've created during the course of this time and how that can, uh, if leveraged well, can actually have a very great impact on the work that we're trying to do. And we will be interspersing this with the governments, uh, the different stakeholders that we work with, which include government partners, other civil society organizations, and uh, the community also, obviously, that we're working with. Uh, and we'll end this conversation with pros and cons of action research that uh, we found, particularly during this time of a pandemic, how we can overcome some of them. And then we'll open it up for Q&A, as well as comments, any suggestions that you all have to improve some of the things that we've been doing. So uh, if I have to just start on, you know, what is action research, right? And uh, then Hitesh, please jump in with uh, more details on this. But when we're talking of what action research is, there is a huge difference between that and traditional research. And then there are some similarities. So Hitesh, if you could walk us through what action research is, the types of action research, and then we'll talk about some of the methodology pieces. Sure. Thanks, Madhuri. So I'll just start with a, a brief background of you know what Indus Action does and where does uh, action research fits in our work and how it got modified and changed uh, in the midst of the pandemic. So in, at Indus Action, we uh, largely work on bridging the gap between the access and supply in implementation of legislated rights. So we have been working on right to education, uh, maternity benefits entitlement, and delivery benefits for uh, construction workers in the space of livelihood. In the midst of the pandemic uh, and prior to the pandemic, we have been uh, you know, engaged in multiple uh, sort of projects on research. Uh, some of them have like long-term impact on uh, what the policy outcomes could be and some of them uh, which are immediate requirements of our government partners. Basically, uh, in general, in academic definitions, how people separate action research from conventional research is that it is it has it is it requires immediate uh, process changes. Uh, so for instance, if it requires immediate results uh, from a research, uh, on an ongoing project, uh, for instance, assessing the efficiency of the outcomes of a project. Action research becomes more relevant in that space in comparison to conventional research, but it's more time consuming. Uh, it requires a more uh, a granular uh, deep dive into a literature research methodology, uh, design of the research. And of course, uh, there is an uh, element of peer review involved in uh, conventional academic research, whereas action research happens more in the domain of practitioner research. Uh, where are the practitioners itself uh, themselves are part of the uh, research process and it is primarily driven by and hinged on the requirements of our uh, in our interactions case uh, requirements of the government partner for instance we have been uh, you know partnering with wcd department in delhi and just to add a caveat uh, i'll be sharing a few research outcomes and our insights from the experiences of engaging with the research so uh, this one request as uh, i think that they also pointed out uh, this is government data so I'll request everyone to, you know, uh, not share it publicly. Uh, so these are largely uh, insights drawn uh, from our practices for other organizations to, you know, uh, uh, you know, take you from. So yeah, just to add that caveat, just to share a few examples, uh, we conducted two types of uh, action research during the pandemic. First was to address immediate uh, indicators which the department uh, wants to focus on. For example, uh, one of the projects that we took was uh, assessing the efficiency of prior rations, take home rations for pregnant and lactating mothers uh, under the ICDS scheme. Primarily, want, uh, the department wanted us to assess the efficiency of de delivery, uh, how Anganwadi workers are delivering it, and uh, the rate of uh, delivery uh, for uh, pregnant and lactating mothers. So largely, uh, we did multiple rounds of action research on the database provided by the department. And as we, uh, you know, uh, moved along, uh, over a period of time, the rate of delivery also improved uh, depending on the outcomes which are coming out from research. I'll talk briefly about uh, the long term uh, impact of the other kind of research that we did was large scale qualitative study we did on Pradhan Mantri Matra Vandana Yojana, which is a maternity entitlement scheme under which 5000 DBT is delivered to pregnant and lactating mothers over a, over three installments in the space of one year. Uh, so that was a, a long term uh, sort of 
one month long uh, qualitative study which in which we did deep dive uh, in the qualitative interviews uh, with uh, pregnant and lactating mothers with uh, anganwadi workers and also with district officers of the uh, women and child development department and uh, that report is something which we submitted to the department and it was a full fledged report with large scale insights not focused on single indicators which was the case in the previous take home rations research so here uh, to improve the efficiency we uh, deep dive into all kinds of indicators which could perhaps be you know improved uh, through a process changes by the department so this is uh, another kind of action research that we attempt uh, largely again both of them are focused on improving service delivery of uh, entitlements uh, by the respective departments we work with so madhuri i request to share a few examples uh, from chatisgarh as well so uh, when we are like the types of action research and uh, the two things that hitesh just mentioned right of uh, immediate process changes and long term policy changes we realized in uh some of our work in chatisgarh and hyderabad and i'll mention both of those examples and also tap into methodology a little bit so uh, in hyderabad we were working with the wcd department for telangana there we tried understanding the the requirement of women or their preference in terms of a take home ration versus hot cooked meals uh, so spot feeding that is done there uh, if you look at a traditional research methodology of when we come up with a research question we do some background uh, study on it we do a literature review then we you know collect our data and analyze it come up with uh, whatever our final conclusions are right the difference that we are seeing uh, in action research and that in traditional research is that we're still coming up with a research question but as hitesh mentioned sometimes it hinges on the requirements of our partners and here again the government of telangana was uh, who we were working with to understand what kind of ration would uh, the women prefer and what time of the day who are the people at home who are actually eating that ration uh, was it just the pregnant and lactating uh, mother or were there other people in the family who are also eating that same food so we looked at all of those dimensions as part of the main research question of understanding timing as well as uh, the quantity and quality of the food being served and then instead we did a very quick and dirty literature review so the time i think is very crucial in some of these short term action research uh, projects that we've been doing over the past year we don't have the uh, privilege so to say of spending a couple of months on doing the literature reviews and understanding all of the background data so it's more a quick lit review along with a recce of the ground itself so doing both qualitative and quantitative studies uh, in this past year again qualitative has been uh, a challenge slightly because not able to be on the ground as much and uh, everything has been phone surveys more so so the quantitative survey we did there was about 3000 mothers were called and asked about the their food choices preferences of timing etc and we created a whole questionnaire around it we vetted that questionnaire with um, and that was part of our you know uh, making sure that literature supporting what we're asking as well and uh, then we conducted the survey did the analysis and very quickly presented that data to the secretary there and there were some actionables that came out of it and the ecosystem that it can affect is potentially 6 and 1/2 lakh women in telangana who are uh, partaking in that program right so that's one example where we realized that uh, and some of the the nuances that came out from the study the, in terms of the geography so we did it in three districts and we uh, identified one of those areas where there was more need of uh, take home ration versus hot cooked meals the reason why women didn't want to come to the anganwadi was uh, like there were a lot of questions on the quality of food being provided so about 70% of the uh, women had said that they had no issues coming to the anganwadi but the remaining 30% who did said that it was because they weren't okay with the quality of food being provided and that was a sizable number to actually look into what were the challenges that are coming about in providing uh, good quality food so with like these smaller action steps a uh, next like a bigger step could be taken to make sure that you know the cycle improves another example that i could give is from chatisgarh and uh, here we'd work with the epod team which i think tanya is going to be presenting tomorrow or in the next uh, session as well about uh, you know the migrant workers who were coming back home during the crisis last year and uh, we created a quick again we worked with the government on this so with the panchayati raj department and uh, with the labor departments as well on the ground and the health department to understand people who were coming back to the quarantine centers and the idea there was to take a small sample uh, figure out the conditions of the quarantine centers and uh, how many 
at whether there were any gender issues at play, whether we were trying to make sure that all of the amenities that were promised by the government were being provided to the people. So those like couple of things that we worked on within Chhattisgarh, we realized that action items or action steps that needed to be taken were very immediate. So this was on a, a daily feedback loop as well. But what resulted as uh, at the end of this entire action research stint was that we came up with some concrete next steps for the government to take uh, if this were to be repeated. And we're seeing that right now in the second wave where people have started migrating back and quarantine centers have been reopened because there is interstate and interstate migration. And some of these uh, suggestions that we had the last time around uh, as the end of our action research is being taken up as suggestive measures right now. So that in all of these things, I think one piece that um, you know, a thread that ties all this together right now in terms, particularly in this current time, is technology. Because uh, our presence on the ground has been limited. And we've not been able to, you know, be doing all of these surveys or talking to people everywhere is not possible on the ground. And so technology ends up playing a huge role, be it telephonic surveys, be it creating forms, dashboards, etc. Uh, that has been a huge driver in conducting this action research. And I think uh, Ashish would be great to hear from you on you know how re benefit has been doing this work in karnataka over the past year yeah uh, thank you madhuri uh, our vision what we do is we work you know with the youth um they're known as sol ninjas and we build a community across india to tackle local issues with local data and local campaigns and localized you know solutions uh, that's where you know uh, we work that's the space we work as you know an organization i'll just you know take you all through uh, what madhuri was mentioning about how technology you know, mixed with, you know, localized data and, you know, solutions, how that, you know, worked out during the pandemic and, you know, uh, the six months phase, you know, that we all, you know, faced during, you know, before December. I will just uh, take you all through uh, the use cases uh, before, you know, going to the use cases. I'll just, you know, tell you all, like, uh, we made a you know, dashboard which had about one lakh plus data points uh, using the dashboard plus the community uh, of, you know, organizations and volunteers, we were able to, you know, uh, support 11 lakh, you know, plus people uh, during the pandemic, you know, 10, you know, 10 plus partners across four states and 100 plus volunteers uh, joined, you know, during the course of this uh, pandemic to, you know, support the on-ground operations as well, as well as a centralized team to, you know, look after a lot of things that were you know, onboarded on the dashboard. Uh, the first use case uh, is, you know, need for ration and food support during the lockdown, right? And there were multiple people during, you know, the first 21 days as well. There were a lot of people, you know, you know, supporting need for food, ration and information on COVID testing centers. And we discovered that multiple organizations are serving, you know, single geographical area or they're, you know, traveling from longer areas and creating a lot of duplication. And they coordinated on WhatsApp, uh, which meant a lot of communication gap because, you know, the internet and all of it. And what happened, you know, in that during that time was a lot of duplication was happening. The same people were giving it to the same people. So we were like, okay, how can we, you know, uh, overcome this problem? So then spreadsheets were good. Uh, but the problem with, you know, spreadsheets is visualization is the problem. So then we created, you know, a, a dashboard, which was, you know, showing patterns as to where the organizations are actually delivering their, you know, food ration. Uh, so that they, as soon as they delivered, they marked that the delivery is being done for that particular individual. So the duplication was, you know, being curtailed and seeing where actually people are not going and where are the geographical boundaries that, you know, uh, NGO or an organization is serving. So they were, you know, in the second phase of the lockdown, the previous one, not the current one, uh, the second phase of the lockdown when it happened. So the NGO started, you know, seeing their geographical boundaries of wards and zones within Bangalore and they started serving within their own zones. So because now they got to know where actually to, you know, uh, be catering to their resources to and not duplicate. And I'll just show you how the dashboard looks and what are the different data points um, in the dashboard in the next slide. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Okay, uh, here it is. So, you know, we were mapping, you know, across, you know, Bangalore and this also included certain parts of, you know, Chennai, Delhi um, and et cetera. So where number of, what was, you know, we are, what was more and more uh, uh, coming across during pandemic, a lot of people wanted to help. A lot of people needed help. But the government in the starting didn't know who, where were the people who needed help, right? They didn't know where were these people exactly. So I think that is where the volunteers and the community came across and plotted, 
people who require help on the dashboard so now people who really require you know support wanted to support them got to know where are they so then they started you know putting across their resources in that direction so that both the mapping of you know people who require support and people who can support both of them were on the dashboard including you know uh, volunteers corona testing centers fever clinics a lot of you know important data points that were required to really cater and support you know on ground local governments on ground local governments plus the ngos were on the dashboard i think this is a uh, one use case um taking you to another use case which is pretty interesting and that we tried out during the pandemic and which is helping us even after a lot of people have access you know to mobiles but during the pandemic downloading apps you know internet is slow but how can information reach to the person because now you can't go on ground and ask people right a lot of people didn't want to you know go on the ground and do a lot of things but how can then be leverage tech but the problem with technology is sometimes internet is slow low models of phone is not helping you know reach the you know uh, the information reach the end user so then we thought like everyone uses whatsapp so how can we really use whatsapp you know to support the citizen in the end a uh, one such experiment was what we tried to do was uh, there's something known as a chatbot whatsapp chatbot uh, where it is a dual thing where there are automated messages i will show an example in the next slide there are automated messages plus there's back end support uh, it is a mixture of offline plus online so online it's automated it gives you automatic you know responses plus offline we respond in the back end if they really require any urgent you know information or sorts so i think that's a dual thing known as uh, chatbots which we used for information on testing centers location of fever clinics location of ration shops and that's what we did uh, within conjunction with the uh, rural development panchayati raj uh, department of karnataka they utilized the chatbot to uh, you know for last mile dissemination of information that was uh, the other use case of how technology really helped during the pandemic and just to say like how uh, uh, after pandemic also we are trying to use them for other kind of you know works or uh, we were we, we did booth mapping uh, for janagra and dbmp uh, uh, this was they wanted to take the fight for you know pandemic at the very booth level uh, so just mapping the booths helping them map the booths at the booth level that helped you know through the uh, uh, the chatbot and the other one we recently you know completed was we worked with the karnataka state legal services authority Uh, upon the high court judgment that they wanted all the potholes in bangalore mapped so i think again chatbot came to use about 7000 plus you know uh, uh, data points were collected using the chatbot which includes location name certain you know information pictures all of it so this is how i think uh, technology you know came to use uh, madhuri you can just go to the next slide where you can just see one use case of uh, the chatbot so fever clinic when you just type fever the rest is automatic uh you know it will ask you share your location once you share the location it will share you the nearest medical you know center and you can click on that link and you can you know access the location of the fever clinic or the testing center so this was uh, another use case and i think we are trying to use more of you know these tools for all the other uh, things as well and it is continuing to help us uh, you know address very very local level challenges with local community local data and local campaigns and that's how it helped and that's what you know we pitched to the government as well thanks ashish yeah that was very uh, interesting to see how it was uh, you know how we did manage to leverage tech to make the best use of the campaigns we had the challenge that you know some of the challenges that we faced with technology and uh, we can add examples from you know the different campaigns we've had are with just access to technology at the base level making sure that you know our communities or just creating since this is supposed to be so quick the iterative nature of uh, using technology becomes a challenge sometimes and uh, with action research we realized that what tool we're using becomes important because how quickly are we able to relay that information back for some action to take place right like that's the main and that the data needs to be reliable it needs to be you know valid and uh, hitesh if you want to talk to some of these uh, places so oh, thanks ashish for bringing the segue into technology uh, this is something which we want to bring in as well uh, a large part of action research is uh, hinge quite uh, largely on uh, the technology capability of the team uh, so how quickly we churn out the survey tool uh, the questionnaire and you know the dashboarding uh, technology uh, expertise available in the team uh, so uh, the speed of that process uh, uh, 
ultimately reflects on how quickly you know uh, the team gets trained uh, in the uh, in question uh, in how to administer the questionnaire in the field or in the telephonic survey uh, and that ultimately uh, the the feeding of live data on the dashboard also improves the trust of the government partner you know uh, the fact that they have access to live data of the uh, demographies that they are trying to uh, target uh, uh, systemic interventions for uh, makes it uh, makes them quite powerful uh, in terms of you know immediate decision making uh, so that power of immediate decision making through these uh, live data coming in on dashboards have been very helpful for them uh, to you know make quick and accurate supply side interventions to uh, administer uh, welfare benefits in the end what we wanted to say uh, was that there are certain pros and cons to uh, how we do ex action research as well uh, first of course is that the research outcomes and findings are easily synthesizable and you know uh, it is concretized for pointed uh, policy uh, recommendations and process improvements uh, that we make uh, to the government to meet that extent the relevance of action research is higher in comparison to you know conventional uh, academic research that we do as i said previously the access to live data and relevant information to officials is makes them quite empowered thirdly and the most important thing it's it has an immediate utility it's not meant to give a generalizable truth claim uh, which has implications, uh, long-term implications for, uh, you know, either ecosystem decision-making or government decision-making, but these are specifically focused on indicators uh, which the government want uh, quick information on. So these are uh, the top three uh, pros we wanted to, you know, uh, point out about the uh, action research and the cons. Uh, of course, unlike conventional research, uh, we don't have peer reviews available to, uh, you know, get the research methodology, the process of data collection, and subsequent, subsequently the synthesizable, uh, how we synthesize the information. So for to that extent, uh, we don't have strong peer reviews. Largely the scrutiny is driven by the team members and the government bureaucrats who are partners. The fact that it, it is fast, so the, the possibility of certain information, crucial uh, granular information missing out in comparison to long-term research is also a possibility. So that is one another con that we found, found out. And thirdly, a lot of these these uh, this research which happens in partnership with governments happens in silos. And there is a lot of risk of replicating existing research and then subsequently using resources to arrive at similar uh, learnings uh, from the ground. I think one uh, learning that we have had is like, just like conventional research, if there are platforms to act our uh, uh, action research outcomes, uh, methodology, and designs of uh, design of research to you know get quick uh, peer-reviewed feedback from similar uh, practitioner researchers community uh, that can really you know improve the the quality and uh, the accuracy of what we do. Uh, there are certain examples uh, which we wanted to share. One example, of course, uh, what we did with UNDP uh, during the pandemic. I'll just briefly uh, share some of the activities that uh, which we uh, did with UNDP to. Uh, you know, have long-term impact. Uh, so we did a brief structured questionnaire for households to basically, you know, understand realities of migrant laborers, uh, their loss of income, duration of their unemployment, poverty status, how it has affected their food security and their spending patterns, uh, you know, whether they've taken debts or not and dependents in the family and of course their location and health profile of their household. So these uh, critical elements were also part of our long-term research project that we took. Uh, but again, these are largely to inform the ecosystem. I think Madhuri can come in about uh, the experience from Chhattisgarh as well, or how you know long-term ecosystem outcome was also moved uh, after our, we uh, shared our research work with the relevant departments. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Hitesh. And I'll also take up uh, Rim Jim's question, which has come on chat, right? You know, inclusion of marginalized communities or populations in action research. Some of like the pros that we've seen, one I'd already mentioned about the Chhattisgarh thing. Ashish has already mentioned how the Karnataka government took up some of the pieces that ReBenefit worked with on technology. We also have seen like some immediate term changes in the way things are functioning, particularly with the quarantine centers. We saw that, you know, access or provision of all of the pieces that were needed were given immediately because this was highlighted it was taken through the entire loop of governance one uh, sort of con here is that it depends on you know where you're working who you're working with how much visibility you're able to give to the research that you're doing because action research traditionally if you look at you know before the pandemic a lot of it was done with educators in classrooms where they were trying to uh, quickly you know change the way that classroom outcomes looked like that's where you'd hear a lot about action research previously and uh, we realized that there are some pieces of action research we were doing just as you know our own teams were trying to figure out situations on the ground and correct them quickly but uh, compared to where we were working with the correct stakeholders so to say i mean correct is again very subjective but people who are able to uh, take action or do make those changes that are required at that point so in doing that we realized there was more 
utility or uh, of the research immediately. So Chhattisgarh was one such example. And uh, when we're talking of marginalized populations, again, there are many of them, right? Uh, so in Hyderabad, we work with the PVTG community, so the uh, particularly vulnerable tribal group. Uh, what we did was that we did a qualitative survey with them uh, of about two villages and uh, covered roughly 25 to 30 families, 30 women, where we went on the ground and uh, our teammate Sumant was there on the ground. He went and spoke to them, collected those inputs in person because technology access was a challenge there. In those areas, they were remote and uh, people were not going to be able to fill out a Google form and send us responses. So we did a qualitative and a, a smaller sample size then, right? but a more in-depth source, spending a day or two in getting that and uh, then adding that to the quantitative larger sample that we've already collected and seeing whether there are similarities in these two uh, sample sizes. So a 3000 quantitative uh, sample along with the 25 people qualitative sample and where the more marginalized communities where there was or remote areas also where there access to technology is less, we did qualitative surveys and tried to merge the two. And there were similarities in the results that we found in terms of you know quality of food and access to food, even awareness about different uh, rights that they have, different packages. So that then we tried to bring together. Other like the other con that Hitesh was also mentioning, and that's something we've also seen uh, quite a lot, is with respect to turnaround times. Sometimes, if you're looking at process changes versus policy changes, and during the pandemic, we were seeing that like getting a policy changed is much more difficult than getting a process change, right? So administrative uh, versus political buy-in to certain things, acceptance that, you know, these are issues which there are, there is a problem. Getting other NGOs or partners on the ground, civil society organizations, is these are different stakeholders that are working to recognize that this is a problem and to work towards it was sometimes easier and quicker in this past year and uh, with the government specifically wherever there was very clear data points that we could give right live data that was appreciated a lot and then action was taken quicker so i think uh, it has some of those validity or credibility concerns because we're doing it so quickly and uh, you know is the data accurate enough is it uh, that have we gone into enough depth of what we could have with action research so those are i think some of the questions that we've uh, been grappling with as well. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, um, Madhuri, Ashish, and Hitesh. That was uh, that was very interesting, and thank you for kind of bringing in your sort of contextual and field experiences to just nuance it a little bit. Uh, since we're not such a large group, I just ask anybody if they have any questions, feel free to um, unmute yourself and turn on your video and ask your question. And what also might be helpful is if you sort of introduce yourself, um, your name, where you're from, so it's just easier for perhaps the team to uh, respond to your question. Uh, else feel free to also uh, write out your questions in the chat board. I'm happy to read them out. I see we have a question uh, from Rishabh. Uh, Rishabh, would you like to unmute yourself and just ask your question? Yeah, no, I was just wondering, uh, I have a couple of questions actually. So uh, one is this, that uh, you know, when you do this kind of research and obviously in the early days of doing this research, there will be more problems. And as you sort of give your suggestions, things will improve, but do you get a, a you know, accused of sensationalizing the problems and sort of focusing on what's wrong when, you know, does that happen? And uh, how do you kind of manage that? So uh, I think, Rishabh, one of the most important points, if whenever that in the past year, particularly that when we've been doing this is we need to be objective in what we're presenting as well, right? Like it's important not to just point out everything that's gone bad. Uh, if there is a situation where everything has gone bad, which has not happened, you know, there is still... Uh, if you look at numbers, you look at percentages, it's not that nothing is happening. And sometimes when these requests come from the government, it comes with a viewpoint of, okay, we want to make things better. Can you tell us what's going on? That's not okay. So uh, in presenting the research, I guess, you always have to balance it out a little bit. And you can't always present purely or only the negative picture because that's not the whole picture very often, right? Uh, we realize that, say, with the Anganwadi workers, if you just look at the headline statement that, okay, the, the ration is not being delivered to the women, right? That is the problem statement. And we're like, okay, nobody's giving that or uh, there isn't enough ration. But we realized one of the challenges was that the Anganwadi worker had to carry those sacks of uh, food, so 10 or 20 kilos, to be delivered to all of the houses in that area. And it was not physically possible. So there then, uh, the it's not just that they don't want to give the money, or the food, sorry, but it 
there were other challenges in the background. So presenting it as a holistic picture um, ends up alleviating some of these concerns. But balance is definitely required. So in addition to what Madhuri said, uh, the research objectives, uh, you know, relevance and a requirement for the principal secretary of the department or the director of the department is quite relevant before we start out the research because, you know, uh, there are certain indicators which they are very curious about. Uh, just to share an example, uh, the joint director at WCD in Delhi was pretty curious about, you know, how the uh, ration which is distributed by the department is used by uh, the mothers, uh, the pregnant and lactating mothers. What we found through our research uh, was that uh, largely that food gets shared because let's assume that they give 1400 uh, grams of fortified rations to pregnant and lactating mothers to largely address the problems of anemia, uh, you know, stunting, wasting in, uh, uh, in children at birth. Uh, but the fact that that ration, whether it's cook or a dry ration gets shared in the family. So how much ever they try to, you know, be accurate with the delivery, uh, the ultimate outcome of addressing the problems of anemia uh, and stunting or wasting might not get addressed through that. So, but to do that, to do that research, we had to align uh, on its objectives with the joint director of WCT because she wanted to ask that question. And that also, you know, enabled us to go as deep as we could in that specific uh, research project. So just to answer your question briefly, uh, that alignment is crucial so that, you know, whatever results are there, uh, there is no possibility of sensationalizing it uh, by any uh, stakeholder. Uh, I was just wondering that, you know, a lot of, in the last year, there's a lot of sort of this uh, community created uh, Google Sheet, even right now, right? Uh, in hosp at hospital beds and uh, all kinds of things that are happening. So that's also kind of action. I mean, would you define that as kind of action research in some sense or like, I mean, or can something like that be used to sort of inform action research of the future? And I have a, just a related question. To, this is a po point of crisis and you require immediate kind of like data and stuff. What if there was no crisis? Where is the application of action research then? I can take part of that question and then I would request Ashish and Madhuri to jump in. Uh, so I think in terms of uh, what time period the action research is relevant, I think it is relevant in any time period depending on the immediate requirement of your partner uh, or the problem. Uh, because uh, ration delivery could be a it has to be an immediate issue at any point of time, whether it's a pandemic time or not, because, uh, you know, majority of our population uh, is suffering from wasting and stunting. So uh, depends from person to person uh, and their point of views. I think immediacy of, of any uh, uh, identification of any data point is entirely dependent on the priority of the uh, key bureaucrat. And uh, second thing about dashboards, I think very relevant. Yes, because uh, the conventional ways of uh, aggregating data through uh, you know, uh, in-depth interviews or quantitative interviews, uh, uh, in-person interviews. Uh, it's, of course, is a more personal way of uh, aggregating and capturing information, but dashboards and uh, uh, technology uh, through which the individual shares the data by their own uh, uh, sort of choice, that's a different space altogether because it's a platform where everyone has independence to, you know, feed in data. And uh, the fact that it is live uh, makes decision-making far more easier uh, for uh, the key decision makers as well. So I think Madhuri and Ashish can talk more about it. Um, I think uh, it's a very relevant question, right? I think uh, for like why we, you know, believe, uh, I, I just want to localize this question, okay? So if you can just see the battle of COVID is mainly happening at state and the center level. It's not actually happening at a very district level as of now. Only now, after it hit a lot of things and then now, you know, the center is pushing it at a district level to, you know, battle it out. I feel because the districts are not prepared, might be because of largely, you know, they don't have data or they don't have, you know, uh, coordination with the community and the civil, you know, society. Uh, primarily, that is where I feel like a lot of these solutions are coming up, right? Citizen-led solutions of when everyone is creating, you know, a dashboard or a spreadsheet to, you know, help. I think that's primarily the government role to bring all of them together, right? The coordination work so that, you know, it helps a lot of people. I think that is where, you know, uh, I feel, you know, these dashboards and, you know, these chatbots at a very localized level. Uh, if you just take Bangalore for an example, now the COVID, you know, war is happening at a zone level. The Bangalore is of, you know, eight zones. It is happening at a zone level. But if you come to a very ward level, there's no data. Now I'm saying like, then how, where would you map data? I think that is where, you know, uh, these chatbots and these dashboards tied together with local government and community, when they come together, this become very lively. And just to give you an example, uh, you, uh, I think someone asked about marginalized communities, right? Say, for example, now I'm in Bangalore, I work with transgender community, and this is a live example that happened during the pandemic. 
Now they got to know about the dashboard. They got to know 20 transgender people require help. They didn't have mobile phone, but person who saw the dashboard utilized the information. It empowered an individual as well. I feel sometimes we only think of the government when we see dashboards or information, but it also empowers the individual and an organization to make decisions on the go. That I can go help, you know, say 20 transgender people who are left out of, you know, a lot of, you know, schemes or immediate help. I feel like these are multiple elements, you know, that come together when we talk of, you know, technology in my sense, how much I have worked you know, on the ground as well as, you know, with the local, you know, uh, administration. Yeah, just a very quick uh, addition to uh, a part that you were asking, Rishabh, of, you know, when, if there is no pandemic, uh, how does action research still, like, does it still work? And uh, that's something that we've actually been doing over the past couple of years where uh, we tried doing action research alone as a, like, as a research method to, help in quicker policy and process level changes. And so I'll give you an example of that is uh, in our work with the right to education there we, in the implementation of the policy, there are certain challenges, you know, with, uh, with the documents that need to be collected or submitted for application. And there we did a very quick study with, again, localities, areas, is there a gender component to it? Is there uh, a challenge with any particular document based on the region that the people are coming from? And uh, we conducted that sort of a research study again in a month and a half and came up with the result, gave them to the department that got changed uh, the entire, like the documentation process got changed and it ended up impacting, you know, a huge ecosystem of about 35 lakh families who were then included, who were previously excluded from the policy. So this is in one particular state, but action research as such has been happening before and after the pandemic. Right now, it's just that quicker decision making uh, has become important, but uh, or it's come to the fore more, to, more so. It's always important, I think, quick decision making. And the change that the pandemic has brought about is the whole, you know, the cliche term of data driven decision making that's become an acceptable term now. That's something that everybody is asking for. Uh, bureaucrats that we're working with, anybody, even, you know, organizations on the ground need that data to function. And the more accurate the data, the better. So, yeah, it's, I think been there i get happy to share other examples offline just being mindful of time uh, madhuri there's a question there, if you could could you share a bit about community slash ecosystem of action researchers how rapidly is it growing who, who is part of the yeah. community are there any traditional researchers that are pivoting slash diversifying to do action research yeah a lot of questions in that rohan i uh can send you some resources that we have of you know people who are pivoting into the action research space right now but uh, for COVID, you will find a lot of those. I mean, the Cornet group is an, a very good example, actually, of seeing uh, different organizations that are engaging in action research currently. Uh, traditional researchers that are diversifying to do action research, I guess, it is more the current need that is uh, forcing that. I don't think that traditional research will go away or the need for that will uh, diminish in any form or manner. But action research as a... a tool for quicker decision making for bureaucrats particularly I think will is growing we're seeing that in multiple places and uh, again happy to share more examples later and those and that is diversifying right now I don't think traditional research will go away anywhere I, that's I don't think it's a competition I was just going to ask actually if uh, the three of you had any sort of last comments you'd like to make uh, as we're going to begin to close the session uh, I think I, I just had uh, one point to make uh, sure. uh, I think like Madhuri ended, you know, with saying that uh, I think traditional research would, you know, keep going. Uh, I just had like, see, action-based research, I think one of uh, like um, con that I could see is uh, it's very immediate, right? Addressing like immediate concerns of, you know, say um, the government, whatever they have. Uh, I feel like systemic planning would, you know, not happen as when we, we, when we you know, applied a lot of, you know, uh, thing to the dashboards and the technology. I think intertwining it and seeing it in the holistic way of, you know, say, you know, what, how this will converge with the traditional kind of a thing would be, I feel, you know, more useful to be able to see any kind of a problem, you know, to address it in a long term. Uh, that's it. Otherwise, I feel like it is very important because I feel on the ground, people just require it. You can't wait forever. But yeah, I think both would have to coexist. Kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Ashish. Uh, sorry, Hitesh, do you want to add something as well? No, no, pretty much same. Nothing beyond that. 
Okay, great. Uh, so yeah, I think with that, we'll end this uh, this session, which was action packed, uh, I mean, a lack of a better word. Uh, so thank you so much to Madhuri, Hitesh and Ashish. I think there was a lot of food for thought and very interesting questions asked by, um, by many people in the audience. And we'd be happy to kind of collate all the resources you share and share back. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us. I would also like to say that today is just day two of the conference and we have a lot more sort of conversations planned ahead. So right on this link, if you stay back, uh, we have perspectives and social innovations in pandemic policing, oh, sorry, policing with Ajana Graha and an IPS officer from Assam, Dhananjay Ghanwat, uh, uh, sir. So if you'd like to stick on for that, it's in the same room, so you needn't have to leave. Of course, if you'd like to know more about the Cornet community, you could head on to our to our website, which is www.cornet.in and follow us on Twitter, which is at Cornet underscore India. And of course, if you'd like to join the Cornet community of practice, feel free to reach out to us at hello at cornet.in, maybe to ask us some questions and we can just have a conversation and let you know more about the work that we've been up to. Um, so with that, I close this session. So thank you everyone for joining us.